Chapter 9. Asking Too Much? Read by Shabana Azmi, an Indian actress of film, television and theatre. In the first part of this book I argued that in order to be good people, we must give until if we gave more, we would be sacrificing something nearly as important as the bad things our donations can prevent. Now that we have a better idea of the good that our donations can do, it's time to return and probe more deeply the sense that there must be something amiss with this moral argument because its implications go too far. Almost all of us spend money on things we don't need. To be ethical, do we really have to give them up? Exploring different views of our obligations that stop short of such demanding conclusions will help us decide. A fair share. We've seen that our sense of fairness provides us with a powerful motivation against doing more than our fair share. But does the idea that it is unfair to have to do more than we would have to do if others were doing their share also provide us with an ethical justification for not overstepping the limits of what our fair share might be? Philosophers Liam Murphy and Kwame Anthony Appiah both answer this question affirmatively. They agree that the world's affluent people are obliged to provide enough aid to eliminate large-scale extreme poverty. But this is, in their view, an obligation that we have as a group. Each member of the group is responsible for his or her fair share, and no more. As Appiah puts it in his Cosmopolitanism, If so many people in the world are not doing their share, and they clearly are not, it seems to me I cannot be required to derail my life to take up the slack. Just to see what this would imply, let us assume for the moment that Murphy and Appiah are right. What would your fair share be? If we knew the amount of aid needed to ensure that the world's poorest people have a chance at a decent life, and divided that figure by the number of relatively affluent people in a position to contribute something, this would tell you how much you must donate to do your fair share of meeting our obligation to the poor. One very crude way of calculating this figure is to estimate by how much the income of the world's poor falls below the World Bank's extreme poverty line of $1.90 per day, and then calculate how much more money the poor would need to be above this line so that they would have enough income to meet their basic needs. Lawrence Shandy, Lawrence No, and Christine Zhang did this calculation and came up with figures which show that the amount required to raise everyone above the poverty line has been falling, while foreign aid has been rising. In 1980, raising everyone above the poverty line would have required $300 billion dollars or about three times the value of official foreign aid from all the donor countries of the world. Today, the amount required is, at $80 billion, less than half the $170 billion total value of foreign aid. These figures are expressed in 2015 U.S. dollars. By comparison, in 2017, Americans spent $72.5 billion on alcoholic drinks. Giving just half of this to the poor would cover all Americans' share of what needs to be done and still allow those who enjoy a drink to have one or two. There are two reasons why it would cost less today to bring everyone's income above the extreme poverty line. One is the dramatic decline in the number of people living below that line, from approximately 2 billion people in 1980 to 736 million in 2015. The other is that the average income of those who are still below the line has also risen from $1.09 in 1980 to $1.34 in 2012, again expressed in constant dollars. So the amount it would take to raise the average person in extreme poverty above the line is now less than it used to be. To put the $80 billion cost of closing the poverty gap in relation to what the better-off countries earn, let's compare it with the gross domestic product of the member countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. 
OECD's membership covers the wealthy nations of the world as well as a few that, if not exactly wealthy, are nevertheless comfortable compared to low-income countries. It does not include China or India, nor any country with significant numbers of people in extreme poverty. In 2017, the combined gross domestic product of OECD member countries was $49.78 trillion. Therefore, the contribution needed to close the poverty gap is 0.16% of income, or 16 cents of every $100 these countries earned. This calculation is a kind of thought experiment, and not what it would cost to fund a practical plan to end extreme poverty. For one thing, we are talking about annual income, so extreme poverty would only be ended if the figure were transferred each year indefinitely. Still, as we have seen, that could easily be done, because the total is less than half the amount of official aid that the rich countries give. The more serious problem is that the figure takes no account of the costs of administering the transfer, of ensuring, for example, that only those below the poverty line receive the money, that the funds are not corruptly siphoned off by people who are not below the line, and that the additional spending power of millions of people in poor countries would not cause the prices of food and other necessities to rise, and that the cost of closing the gap would not increase because of population growth in low-income countries. To get an idea of the kind of sum needed for reducing poverty in a more sustainable manner, we can look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals adopted in 2015 by world leaders and by all 193 member states of the UN and intended to be achieved by 2030. The goals seek to continue the progress made between 2000 and 2015 on the Millennium Development Goals set at the UN Millennium Development Summit held in New York in 2000. Although progress on some of the eight Millennium Development Goals fell short of their targets, there were also some notable successes. Perhaps the most important was the goal of halving the number of people living in extreme poverty as compared to a baseline of 1990. That goal was reached in 2010, five years ahead of schedule. As the period for achieving the Millennium Development Goals was drawing to a close, a worldwide public consultation led the UN to set 17 Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. The first of these is to eradicate poverty. Other goals include ending hunger, gender equality, affordable and clean energy, and climate action. In 2015, as these goals were still being finalized, The Economist published an editorial that described them as unfeasibly expensive and estimated that to meet them would cost 2 to $3 trillion a year for 15 years, or about 4% of the world's gross domestic product. It was, the editorial said, pure fantasy to imagine that anything like this would be forthcoming from governments that couldn't even keep their commitments to raise foreign aid to 0.7% of GDP. The editorial then warned that setting 17 far-reaching goals would prove a distraction from a very important goal that, with a sustained effort, really could be achieved at reasonable cost, the elimination of extreme poverty. The UN ignored such critiques and adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, along with 169 targets that are somewhat more specific, but still extremely ambitious. For example, Goal 1 is end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And under that goal, the first target is to eradicate extreme poverty for all people everywhere, while the second is to reduce by at least half the proportion of people in poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. Although it is true that the goals are interconnected, we will not, for example, eliminate extreme poverty unless we can also limit the extent of climate change. I have some sympathy with the view that setting so many goals and targets is a distraction from the first goal, which is achievable if understood in terms of the first target, eradicate extreme poverty. Can this goal be achieved at reasonable cost? According to The Economist, about $65 billion a year would be enough for basic transfer programs to lift everyone above the bare minimum poverty line. 
which I take to be equivalent to eradicating extreme poverty. To be truly realistic, we should be speaking of lifting almost everyone out of poverty because we know that even in affluent countries with comprehensive social security systems, some people have problems that make it difficult for them to take advantage of the resources open to them and so they remain hungry and homeless. Nevertheless, if there were no longer hundreds of millions of people below the $1.90 per day limit, that would be a major achievement that would dramatically reduce human misery. I am skeptical about the claim that this could be achieved for $65 billion a year. That is even less than the $80 billion figure reached by Shandy, No, and Zhang a figure that, as we've seen, is not intended to be a realistic estimate of the cost of lifting everyone out of extreme poverty. If The Economist was too optimistic about the cost of lifting everyone out of poverty, however, it seems unlikely that the editors of that respected financial magazine would have reached an estimate that is less than half the best estimate we can reach on the available evidence. If it is reasonable to make that assumption, $130 $130 billion per year should be sufficient to raise almost everyone out of extreme poverty. Interestingly, even this doubled figure is less than the $170 billion that the world's rich countries give in foreign aid each year. So if the funds now allocated to foreign aid were used in the most effective manner, they should be sufficient to end extreme poverty. Yet, as Shandy No and Zhang point out, only about 2% of foreign aid is directed towards income support. Most of it is used to provide physical infrastructure like roads or buildings or to strengthen institutions. Perhaps this is a strategy designed to end poverty permanently so that one day further support will not be needed. But it would be worth experimenting with more aid going to income support programs, especially if local programs pioneered by non-government organizations like Give Directly continue to show positive outcomes. Now we can calculate how much each affluent person would have to contribute for the combined sum to meet these totals and achieve these results. According to Branko Milanovic of the World Bank, if we define the rich as those who have an income above the average income of Portugal, there were in 2005 855 million rich people in the world. I've not been able to update that figure, but with significant increases in prosperity since then in many countries, and especially in China and India, it seems safe to estimate that there are not less than 1 billion rich people in the world today. The round figure also makes the arithmetic simple. All it would take to raise $130 billion is $130 from each affluent person. Among those billion affluent people, Some are barely above the average income of Portugal, and others are billionaires. It doesn't seem fair that they should all have to give the same amount. It would be better to use a sliding scale, like a tax scale, with the truly rich giving not only a larger sum, but also a greater percentage of their income than those who are average wage earners in an affluent country. In the final chapter, I suggest a sliding scale reflecting this version of fairness. For the moment, however, We can ignore the details and focus instead on the fact that if everyone were doing their fair share, the total amount each of us would need to give in order to wipe out or at least drastically reduce large-scale extreme poverty would be very modest indeed. But most people are not doing their fair share. So we still need to ask, is our fair share really all that each of us is obliged to do? Here's a variation on the pond story. To help us think about this question, you're walking past the shallow pond when you see that 10 children have fallen in and need to be rescued. Glancing around, you see no parents or caregivers, but you do notice that as well as yourself, there are nine adults who have just arrived at the pond, have also seen the drowning children, and are in as good a position as you to rescue a child. So you rush into the pond, grab a child, and place her safely away from the water. You look up expecting that every other adult will have done the same and that all the children will therefore be safe. But to your dismay, you see that while four other adults have each rescued a child, the other five just strolled on. In the pond, there are still five children, apparently about to drown. 
The fair share theorist would say that you have now done your fair share of the rescuing. If everyone had done what you did, all of the children would have been saved. Since no one is in a better position to rescue a child than anyone else, your fair share of the task is simply to rescue one child, and you are under no obligation to do more than that. But is it acceptable for you and the other four adults to stop after you have rescued just one child each, knowing that this means that five children will drown? This question really amounts to asking, is the fact that other people are not doing their fair share a sufficient reason for allowing a child to die when you could easily rescue that child? I think the answer is clear. No. The others have, by refusing to help with the rescue, made themselves irrelevant. They might as well be so many rocks. According to the fair share view, in fact it would be better for the children if they were rocks because then you would be obliged to wade back into the pond to save another child. It is not the fault of the children, whose lives are at risk, that there are other people who could help rescuing them but are refusing to do their fair share. The action or inaction of these people cannot make it right for us to let children drown when we could easily save them. Liam Murphy thinks that if you do save one child in this situation and then refuse to save a second one, you have done nothing wrong. He seeks to explain away the apparent implausibility of this view by conceding that your refusal to save the second child when you could have easily rescued him shows that you have an appalling character. We might, he says, shun a person who can show such emotional indifference to the pressing needs of a specific person in danger of drowning. But it isn't just the person's character that is a problem. It is that he has allowed a child to die when he could have easily rescued that child. He's like children who stamp their feet and say it's not fair and will hear nothing further. A sense of fairness is, as we've seen, advantageous for individuals and for the society in which they live and is probably innate. But when we grow up, we learn that sometimes we have to accept unfairness. If we are in a line of cars waiting to pass an impediment to traffic and someone speeds around the outside of the line and then tries to cut in front of us, Sensible drivers will see the unfairness of that kind of behavior, but won't risk causing an accident to prevent the other car from cutting in. If the costs of insisting on complete fairness are high enough, it is reasonable to take on an unfair burden. Those who refuse as a matter of principle to do more than their fair share are making a fetish of fairness. It's like being in favor of telling the truth and so refusing to lie even when it is the only way to save the life of an innocent person. Normally, we should support fairness and truthfulness, but there are times when sticking to the principle is wrong. This doesn't prove that fairness makes no difference. The example of saving more drowning children than your fair share would require is not one in which, to use Kwame Anthony Appiah's phrase, I must derail my life in order to make up for what others leave undone. Perhaps in saving lives when others are not doing their share, I am obliged to go beyond what strict fairness requires, but I can justifiably stop before I reach the point at which I am sacrificing something nearly as important as the life I am saving. It's difficult to say just what weight, if any, we should give to fairness in such a situation. But even if we grant Appiah's claim that we are not required to derail our lives to make up for the deficiencies of others, we may still be required to do a lot more than most of us do now. A moderately demanding view. If we can dismiss the argument that limits our obligations to our fair share, the next challenge is to examine a number of more demanding standards that have risen in philosophical debates. According to Richard Miller, a philosopher who has written widely about global justice, we ought to give to the point at which, if we were to give more, we would run a significant risk of worsening our lives. But we do not need to go beyond this point. Miller's idea is that morality allows us to pursue the underlying goals to which we are securely attached, but that when others are in need, it does not allow us to spend more than we need to achieve those goals. Garrett Cullity, author of The Moral Demands of Affluence, believes that we should give to the point at which further contributions would undermine our pursuit of intrinsically life-enhancing goods, such as friendship, developing one's musical talents, and being involved in the life of one's community. 
Brad Hooker, in Ideal Code Real World, argues that we should try to live according to the code that, if widely accepted, would lead to the best outcome. Hooker asserts that we are morally required to help those in greater need, even if the personal sacrifices involved in helping them add up to a significant cost, but that we are not required to go beyond this threshold. Miller's standard is the least demanding. If it is important to you to express your sense of who you are by occasionally buying clothes or accessories that are stylish or fun, rather than something more basic, you are permitted to buy those items. The same is true of eating. If we never ate in good restaurants, we could not pursue our worthwhile goal of eating in a way that explores a variety of interesting aesthetic and cultural possibilities. Similarly, Enjoying the capacity of great composers and performers to exploit nuances of timber and texture to powerful aesthetic effect is a worthwhile goal, and one that justifies buying more than minimal stereo equipment. Kaliti's standard is more demanding. His intrinsically life-enhancing goods don't appear to include things like stylish clothes, though they do include whatever is necessary to enjoy music, since he regards that as an intrinsically life-enhancing good. But for most goods, if there is a cheaper alternative I can pursue that is not substantially worse for me, that is what I should go for. Only goods like friendship and integrity, which involve our deepest commitments, should not be judged on the basis of how much they cost. Hooker acknowledges that his criterion is vague, but says it would be met by a person who regularly gives a little money or time to charities. He stresses that the test is whether all of the time or money given adds up to a significant cost, not whether the sacrifice involved on any particular occasion of helping someone in greater need is significant. Hence, giving to this level would not require foregoing, Hooker says, one's personal projects. So our obligations to the poor do not, in Miller, Kalati and Hooker's views, go as far as requiring us to give to the point where if we gave any more, we will be sacrificing something nearly as important as a child's life. However, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that these three philosophers agree that if we fail to give anything or give only trivial sums to aid the world's poorest people, we are acting wrongly. Depending on the facts about how much it would take to overcome widespread extreme poverty, the obligations Miller, Kalati and Hooker posit may be considerably more demanding than the fair share view. Miller, for example, would allow us to purchase a luxury item of attire only occasionally. The stereo that the music lover may buy can be more than minimal, but that implies that we are not justified in buying at the top of the range, even if we can afford it. Kaliti allows us to spend money on significant activities that will enhance our lives, but spending on trivial items should, in his view, be redirected to helping combat poverty. Hooker's standard imposes on us a significant personal cost. Against the background of a world in which most affluent people give only a trivial proportion of their income, or none at all, to help the poor, the agreement among the four of us that we all ought to be giving much more than that is more important than the differences between us. Many people get pleasure from dressing stylishly, eating well and listening to music on a good stereo system. I'm all for pleasure. The more, the better. Other things being equal. There's no denying that there is value in the things that Miller, Kaliti and Hooker think we are entitled to spend our money on. The problem is that other things are not equal. We are living in the midst of an emergency in which about 15,000 children die every day, mostly from preventable causes and treatable diseases. Millions of women are living with fistulas that could be repaired, and millions of people whose sight could have been saved or can be restored are blind. We can do something about this emergency. That crucial fact ought to affect the choices we make. To buy good stereo equipment in order to further my worthwhile goal or life-enhancing experience of listening to music is to place more value on these enhancements to my life than on whether others live or die, can be a full member of their community or an outcast, can see or remain blind. Can it be ethical to do that? For the same reason, philanthropy for the arts or for cultural activities is, in a world like this one, morally dubious. In 2014, the J. Paul Getty Museum paid a sum said to be in excess of $65 million for an Edward Manet painting called Spring. 
In buying this painting, the museum has added to the abundance of masterpieces that those fortunate enough to be able to visit it can see. But if it only costs Seva or Fred Hollow's foundation as little as $50 to perform a cataract operation in low-income countries, that means there are 1,300,000 people who can't see anything at all, let alone a painting, whose sight could have been restored by the sum paid for spring. At $650 to $700 to repair a fistula, $65 million could have given nearly 93,000 women another chance at a decent life. At $2,041 a life, Give Well's estimated median cost per death averted by Malaria Consortium's Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention Program, it could have saved the lives of 31,847 children. How can a painting, no matter how beautiful and historically significant, compare with that? If the museum were on fire, would anyone think it right to save the money from the flames rather than a child? And that's just one child. In a world in which more pressing needs had already been met, philanthropy for the arts would be a noble act. Sadly, we don't live in such a world. So neither the fair share idea, nor any of the more moderate ethical approaches we have examined, give us a tenable answer to the question, what ought I do to help those in great need? Nevertheless, I think that these views do have a place in answering a different practical question to which I now turn.